Bill Smirconish in Philadelphia. We welcome our viewers in the United States and around the world. The president up early and tweeting again, this time about his desire for equal time on TV. Come on, Mr. President, you have your own channel and you're welcome here on any Saturday of your choosing. And I will treat you with dignity and respect. Today marks one year from the day that we learned that Russia was interfering with the U.S. election. In pursuing the Russian medal and possible collusion, will prosecutor Robert Mueller make President Trump testify under oath? That's the belief of Ken Starr, who investigated the Whitewater and White House intern scandals he's here to discuss. Plus, with U.S. Embassy personnel in Havana suffering from a mysterious illness, this week President Trump expelled 15 Cuban diplomats. Are we headed for Cold War II? A week after the massacre in Las Vegas, investigators still trying to learn what drove the shooter. I was in Vegas this week and asked its colorful ex-mayor, Oscar Goodman, a former mob lawyer who played himself in Casino, about how his psych city is coping. And Megyn Kelly trying so hard to cross over from Fox to NBC, but struggling with both viewers and critics. In this political divide, is it just impossible for anyone to switch sides? But first, they told us so. One year ago today, October 7, 2016, brought the news that the Russian government was meddling in the U.S. presidential election. At 3 p.m., the news came in the form of an unprecedented statement from the Director of National Intelligence, James R. Clapper, Jr., and the Department of Homeland Security. The statement pointed a finger at Vladimir Putin without naming him. Quote, we believe, based on the scope and sensitivity of these efforts, that only Russia's senior most officials could have authorized these activities, the statement said. To be sure, the statement received coverage... But as detailed in Michael Isakoff's new Yahoo documentary, 64 Hours in October, the Russian medal was not the blockbuster you might have expected, because it quickly became buried under two other stories that broke immediately thereafter. The Washington Post revelation of the Access Hollywood tape, in which the Republican presidential nominee used crude and offensive language, followed by a WikiLeaks dump of Clinton campaign chair John Podesta's emails. It was a stunning news cycle in a campaign that had many. In retrospect, it seems difficult to believe that the release of the DNC emails immediately after the Post broke the Access Hollywood tape was a coincidence. And both obscured the more serious matter, the effort by a hostile foreign government to determine the outcome of our election. One story involved a verified attack on our national security, but both of the others appealed to our prurient instincts. The Access Hollywood tape had all the elements, sex, lies, videotape, and captured our attention to the detriment of more serious matters. Many Americans spent the entire campaign rubbernecking instead of focus on substance, and many waited till they saw the results of the election to decide whether to be concerned about Russia based entirely on the outcome. But it doesn't matter who won or whether the outcome was altered that our partisan domestic differences didn't stop at the water's edge was itself proof of the effort's success. It's been a full year. We didn't listen then, and some of us aren't listening now. Joining me now is Ken Starr, former U.S. Solicitor General and federal judge. He, of course, was independent counsel in the Whitewater and Clinton intern investigations. Judge, nice to have you here. Many forget that while President Clinton remained in office after your independent counsel inquiry, you nevertheless obtained 14 criminal convictions. Here's my question. How likely, with regard to Russia, that regardless of what happens to the commander-in-chief, there will be multiple indictments of underlings? It depends on the facts, but I will tell you this, given what we do know, uh, especially given what happened uh, this summer with respect to the FBI's intrusion into uh, Paul Manafort's uh, condominium, uh, in light of the revelations that we've seen about General Flynn, uh, I have a sense that there will in fact be uh, indictments. Uh, there may be guilty pleas and so forth, but we shall see. What I find very interesting, very briefly, is in light of the information that 
is now coming out with respect to Russian attempts to influence both the national election and 21 different states, what I expect to see is serious consideration of indicting one or more foreign nationals. Judge, you've said that the president himself will ultimately be under oath in connection with the Mueller probe. In what scenario? It will probably be by invitation. Uh, it, there will be every effort, I'm confident, of Bob Mueller, who's a complete professional with total integrity, to respect the dignity of the office of the president, which you said at the top of the hour. Uh, the presidency deserves uh, respect. And so the way it will likely work out in the fullness of time is for uh, the president's uh, private lawyers, led by Ty Cobb, who's very able, uh, and uh, Bob Mueller, personally to sit down and discuss the situation. Uh, the, the President of the United States during uh, the Whitewater investigation was uh, under oath uh, on several occasions uh, in the White House. There was one occasion, of course, the civil litigation brought by Paula Corbin Jones when he was under oath uh, in a private law office here in Washington, D.C. So it will depend on the negotiations, but I think that is a logical uh, step in Bob Mueller is eventually completing his investigation. Do you believe that Bob Mueller has or will see the president's tax returns? That I don't know. Uh, it would be a logical step, but it really depends always on the evidence that you have and then your assessment of the evidence with your able team, not only of lawyers, but of analysts. Uh, in my experience in Whitewater, we really depended on superb financial analysts uh, from both the FBI and the IRS. These are professional people. They are not m motivated by partisan politics. They're simply trying, whatever their politics are, they leave that. I mean, the way it's to work, and I have every confidence that Bob Mueller will see to it, that politics are left at the door. Bob happens to be a Republican, but he is a fact and law person. And I think that's what we're going to get. We're going to get an honest assessment of the facts. A legal hypothetical, but one that you had to deal with. Can a sitting U.S. president be indicted? The Justice Department has an informal policy that the president, the sitting president, cannot. Uh, and uh, that is not embodied in any regulation or the like. It is, a, it is an understanding. Uh, there have been policy statements to that effect. Uh, my own view is that a president of the United States can be indicted. Everyone is under the law. And I, I, I bring this up because this summer we learned from a Freedom of Information Act request that the New York Times initiated that there was a memo written at your request on your watch that looked at the issue and came to the conclusion that you've just offered. Yes, uh, the, the, our basic system, going back to Magna Carta, uh, you know, 800 years ago in England, was that every person is subject to the law. Now. That also means the criminal law. Now, what I think our separation of powers system means is that, as I said earlier, the president must be treated with every possible respect. So that can affect scheduling and the like. But the Supreme Court of the United States held in the civil setting in Clinton versus Jones, the Paula Corbin Jones, unanimously that the president of the United States had to respond to lawful process, including a civil lawsuit that strikes me all the more so if the criminal laws have been violated, which is an, obviously a big if. In the Clinton case, you made a determination, correct me if I'm wrong, that a congressional impeachment process was more suitable than the indictment scenario that I've just asked you hypothetically. In the current case, and I want to make crystal clear, Judge, there's been no showing that would suggest the potential at this stage of such an indictment, so I'm asking it hypothetically. But in the Russian probe scenario, which would be better suited? A congressional impeachment inquiry like we had with Clinton or an indictment scenario? Well, I certainly would prefer, and it is a hypothetical, and may it never happen for the sake of the country. We want stability and have our policy disagreements and sort them all out. But I think when it comes to the President of the United States, it is in fact preferable for the matter, depending on the nature of the alleged offense, for the matter to come before the House of Representatives. It's the ultimate political act by the people to determine whether the President is fit to continue to serve in office. And that determination was made uh, in the 
President Clinton's situation. I should just add very briefly that there was a statute under which I was serving that actually directed us to refer information to the House of Representatives. That is no that statute is no longer in effect and the Department of Justice regulations under which Bob Mueller was appointed does not contemplate that at all. And a final point, your inquiry began with a, a land transaction and ended with an intern scandal, underscoring the point that once there's an investigation underway, you really don't know where it's headed. Apply that lesson to this case. Yes, that's a stay tuned because information comes in and as long as it arises out, it, the information that's coming to you arises out of the investigation, then it's appropriate for the special counsel to conduct the investigation. In my situation, in our situation, in the Whitewater days, we returned to the Attorney General of the United States and said, here's the information we have with respect to the Monica Lewinsky situation and she, Janet Reno, specifically and expressly authorized it. There's a very different mechanism in place now. Judge Starr, thanks so much for your expertise. We appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. What are your thoughts at home? Tweet me at Smirconish or go to my Facebook page. I'll read some responses throughout the course of the program. I think we've got two ready to go right now. Wrong you are, Smirconish. Well, I'm often wrong. It absolutely does matter who won. With Russia's hands in the pot, look who we got. No, Deborah, you're misunderstanding. What I'm saying is that to many with regard to this Russia probe, to them they want to know, well, was it outcome determinative? as if the only way we should care about this is if they played a role in the direct election of Donald Trump, to which I say, absolutely not. What matters is that they attempted, and, and we should all be concerned about that, not suit up in our partisan armor. One more if I've got time. Here it is. Uh, Smirconish invites at real Donald Trump on air. Come on, President, think of the ratings. Uh, look, I, I have an open door for him. I have invited him previously, and I would treat him with dignity and respect. I, I would like to think that he would enjoy the opportunity to participate with my very direct but fair questioning. And we'll see. Still to come, it sounds like a spy novel after U.S. embassy workers in Havana were stricken by a mysterious illness. President Trump has now expelled 15 Cuban diplomats. Is the Cold War reheating? Senator Chris Coons of the Foreign Relations Committee is here. And the real reason for Megyn Kelly's rocky start on NBC.